In this video, I cover what I consider to be the pen trends of 2022, and it's going to be very heavily based in Japan since I do live here. It's a collaboration with Jacob from Foodafan, and he just put up a, a post on his blog called uh, Japan Pen Trends 2022. And I'll link to his blog, his blog post, and his Instagram because I borrowed a lot of his pictures straight off of his Instagram. We don't agree on a few things, but mostly we do agree on a lot of things. He does gasp, have a section on pencils in there. He's really gone off the rails, but then you'll see in this video that maybe I have too. And during the video, I'll announce the winner of my last video's giveaway, a Waka um, refillable brush pen. And then also at the end, I'll be giving away a really special Lamy Safari that you can only get in Japan. I split this video up into three parts, it makes sense. Uh, paper, pens, and ink. And in each one I kind of cover a little bit of some of the highlights of this past year. And then I make some predictions. And uh, there's a prediction in there that's, yeah, it's pretty wild. Last year with the sale of Tomoe River to the company Sanzen, it kind of put the whole paper world into a big tumble. It seems like every other day new papers coming out, someone's trying to replace Tomoa River. And uh, Sanzen came out with their own version of Tomoa River and it's, it's, it's really good paper, I like it. Um, but it's not exactly the same as the old Tomoa River. And we saw like Hobonichi, which is one of the big users of Tomoa River paper, put out a sample of the successor in the planners that they released in August for 2023 and they put it they, they used the old Tomoe River in the Hobonichis but they put a sample piece inside for everyone to try out so they can get ready for next year's planners which will be released next year August of next year so it's such a big deal that it kind of wanted to get everybody prepped for it it's a it's a big change the new Tomoe River is supposed to be kind of made more for standing up to the friction pen. The friction pen, this is, I got this from Jacob, uh, is kind of the most used pen in the Hobonichi. And so they kind of made it where it would stand up to the erasing a little bit better. Tomoe River has had a really interesting arc in the history of paper for fountain pens. About 10 to 12 years ago, Tomoe River really started to catch the eye of fountain pen users. And at that time, there were a few people that were importing like reams, because you only buy it in like reams, like giant amounts of Tomoe River into the United States and then like selling it individually. But it was really hard to get a, a journal. I don't think there was not any normally for sale. And this one is basically filled with blank Tomoe River paper and it's handmade, it's leather and it's handmade. And at the time I was living in Hawaii and this was the only way I could get a Tomoe River Journal. And this, this book cost me $200. I mean, it was, I had to order to Japan, the guy handmade it. You had to wait a couple months for him to make it. And it was such a precious commodity. I just remember that. And, I just, and then it got to be where Nanami paper came along and you could get journals pretty regularly. And, and they had a connection in Japan and had Tomoe River made into journals. And then they had dot grid and things like that. But I remember, they would release like some Tomoe River journals and they would just get sold out in like a day. And I just always have to check the Nanami uh, website to see if they had, you know, posted any new journals for sale. And then it got to the point where, you know, Tomoe River was just available everywhere. And we kind of got used to that. And it became pretty much, well, the king of all paper as far as fountain pens. And I know a lot of people don't like it for various reasons. It's really thin, you've got some show through. But for the most part, if you're gonna mess around with ink, just the, the tactile feel of it and um, its ability to handle any kind of ink really made it very popular. I would say before Tomoe River when I was using fountain pens, the go-to paper was always Rhodia and Clairefontaine because that was what the Western world knew and they're very good high quality paper. 
but it was like pretty much well if you wanted the good stuff you bought one of those two and I happen to use like Kokuyo and Campus only because I've lived in Japan before in Hawaii I had access to some Japanese stationery but then Tomoe River came along and, in, and it was kind of like the king of paper and then when it started stumbling around a little bit everybody just started popping out of the woodwork and this year this past year was no exception and kind of one of the leaders of just this whole try different kinds of paper was Yamamoto paper and I think quite a few of you know what this is it's just basically different kinds of paper and it explains what the paper is and they've put out new editions I think like every year but they really kind of brought that to the west when they went to like the San Francisco pen show and kind of kind of showed people there's just all kinds of paper so they came out with their memo box but what really struck me this year is I bought a memo box in all the different kinds of paper and there was just so much paper that if I were to not even try all of them, just the ones I was interested in, it overfilled my box. And that was the first time this happened. And there's just such an enormous selection of paper with them that I, I think it really showed this year that paper is becoming more important. People have specific characteristics that they're looking for in paper. For instance, in Tamo River, some people really didn't like the, sh the show through on it. And I particularly like Tamo River because I could just dump all kinds of ink on it and it just wouldn't bleed through to the next page. Cosmo Air Light has a real like extreme ends. People who hate it, people who love it. It has a little bit of a spongy texture. And as an aside, um, Cosmo Air Light will not be uh, continuing anymore. They announced that this year. And if you really like Cosmo Airlight, you can try Idofu. But according to some people, Idofu really is Cosmo Airlight. So I don't know if you like that paper, you may want to buy up the Cosmo Airlight CAL. But chroma shading inks really kind of like messed with paper. As you can see here on Tomo River, like Taupe's chroma shading ink Kamogawa is just absolutely beautiful. And on slight white, it looks pretty good. And on onion skin, it starts to take on a real green cast with a little bit of the chroma shading here on the side. And then with Takasago Premium, it's just like green ink. And I think like Jacob might have been one of the first ones that brought that to my attention when he was messing around with some chroma shading inks on Takasago Premium. They just came out like a totally different color. And I think that's partially what spurred one of the ink trends this year of color changing inks is that some inks are very sensitive to the pH of the paper or maybe the absorbent qualities of the paper but you start to see now that ink shows up different on different paper and as a result paper companies are kind of capitalizing on that along with ink companies. Two years ago these really like I call them the lazy person's ink card because that's what I would do if I did ink cards is you basically it's a blank looking card and you swipe some ink over it over the top of it and you can do it with a q-tip or a paintbrush or a pen whatever you want and then the pattern comes out and then later you can go back and write in the name or whatever if you want to. Ishimaru Bunkodo at the Tokyo International Pen Show this year sold these ink cards and they have um, they, they were in keeping with the tips uh, theme of penguins going to a bar and so there's martini glasses with you know fountain pen bottles in them and fountain pen and a glass pen in it and so uh, when they do show their ink swatches when they sell their ink they use all their ink swatch cards and so it's a consistent paper a consistent size and a consistent design so those became very popular this year and there's many different designs and they also make them in like postcard size so you can swatch the ink on a giant on a postcard and then send the postcard to somebody which I think is really cool I think I'd like to see where they'd even make like a, a journal and you could just swatch different areas and have a design come out that would be even more of a lazy person's way of swatching ink, which would be right up my alley. Also this year, there seemed to be an explosion of light colored inks with dark paper. This one here is the black paper that Plotter puts out as a Plotter refill for their A5 sizes. I also found some navy paper. And then Pilot, surprisingly, they put out these two journals here, and one's amazing green, and I think the other one's some sort of navy blue. But uh, they're, they're dark paper that you can use with like juice up pens or um, white pigment based inks. 
So I think this is also going to continue to be a trend in stretching both the areas of the paper and, and ink. Washi paper in general is pretty hard to write with a fountain pen. It's, it's very textured and almost sometimes just a little bit waxy, but Waka made this paper that you could use a fountain pen with the washi paper. But I think that's now kind of making a nod toward fountain pens and fountain pen ink that washi paper is also trying to get in on the game. And while we're talking about Waka, the winner from the last video of the refillable Waka brush pen and Waka fountain pen friendly washi paper is at BESR75. Please contact me on Instagram and congratulations. And then with this kind of long history of paper, one of the things I found really interesting is just the different ways you can use paper. And like for instance, you know, in, in Japanese culture they have origami where they fold paper into different shapes and things. But an interesting thing about four years ago, three or four years ago, when I went to my first stationery show here in Tokyo, there was a little tiny table with a little company called Box and Needle. And they basically had this part where you could put together a box and cover it with pretty paper, and then the box would end up holding uh, business cards. And so I bought it and I put it together. It was pretty cool. And I've kind of watched them and they have just exploded that people really are kind of getting back into paper and they make all kinds of boxes. This is a video of their store. I went to their store in the southern part of Tokyo and they use a lot of interesting different kinds of paper, a lot of them from the William Morris company and they cover like pen trays and, and stands for um, your phone and, and drawers but these are all like made of cardboard and covered in specialty papers. I thought that was just kind of an interesting uh, growth area in paper. I think my prediction for this year is that paper will continue to evolve and there will be a lot more like competition and creativity in paper. The stumbling of Tomoe River kind of opened up a small vacuum where people are all trying to kind of fill it. So I think there's going to be more paper and more like finickiness with paper amongst um, users and more enjoyment of paper. There are a few pen trends here in Japan this year. One of them is ombre coloring and it, it continued to get more popular. Ombre coloring is when you take a color and you fade it into another color, blend it into another color, or you fade it into something lighter or fade it into something darker. This is something where Pilot took the lead there's a little bit of ombre coloring in the Platinum Pleasure, I believe, and a couple other pens, and then maybe some stationery. Okay, here's Stationery Stations Pink Capless. This is the Hana Shobu, which is uh, this year's special edition Capless, and uh, this picture is from Jacob of Foodafan. And then, as far as like pen bodies, you know, we've had sparkly pens for so long, and I keep predicting the demise of sparkly and it's just not going to happen. People love sparkly pens too much. Also to kind of get out of the sparkly box, pens this year I think have taken on more translucent or matte or frosted finishes as kind of an antidote to sparkly pens. A beautiful example of this is Bungukan Kobayashi's Clematis. And here it kind of like satisfies a few things. It's a 3776 which is a very popular pen in Japan. It has color blocking on the end cap and the finial which is kind of a pinkish red color and then it's purple and the whole thing is kind of a frosted finish and it's just a beautiful pen. This picture is from their Instagram and I'll link to that. Uh, Pena Maestro is kind of a, a place to, to check out on Instagram on what Ko Bungakan Kobayashi is releasing. At the end of last year, the beginning of this year, Stilo and Style had a collaboration with Leonardo and made this beautiful frosted pen. It came both in a uh, silver and gold trim and they sold out. I, I couldn't get a hold of one. And then in July, they added this beautiful multicolored Stilo and Style and Leonardo collaboration pen. 
And this picture is from their Instagram and I'll link um, to their Instagram also. And then there was this Mr. Mori Commission Pen uh, Platinum President. And it has that frosted purple finish, but when you look at it real closely, you realize it's also translucent. You can kind of see the inner workings of the pen. And that purple is just gorgeous. And of course, this picture is from Jacob, a food fan. Usagia Pen Store put out a special edition 3776 called the Jeans Style. And my friend Ben owns one, and it's a kind of a frosted, translucent look with a rose gold trim. It's just a gorgeous pen. I took uh, this picture in this really short video from uh, one of our pen meets we had last month. And again, with keeping with the translucent trend, Pilot came out. Again, Pilot was doing something different. Pilot came out with a 912 in translucent green, brown, and blue. Um, I did a short video on it, and you can check it out right here. And probably the hottest fountain pen this year. I think this is probably worldwide, is Bingu Box's Pilot 823, the Fujiyama. And when they put it up for sale, it was gone in minutes. They had reserved two pens for, for their Ometasando store. And when I'd heard about that, I ran over to the store and then the, then the store was closed. And because they were putting on a pop-up store in one of the department stores. So then I got on the train and ran over the department store and went to their pop-up store in the department store. And they're like, yeah, no, we, we haven't gotten the pen yet. I'm going, please, can I just give you my money and let me reserve one of them? Like, no, you can't do that. And then later, um, beautiful, beautiful Kaudasan um, messaged me on Instagram, said, yeah, we'll hold you one. And I wanted to hug her. <laughs> it was so popular that Bingo Box had asked Pilot to do a second run, and Pilot wouldn't do it. I think they just have, I don't know, the, they had a limited run, and that was it. So they couldn't get any more. And the resale on this pen, it just hit crazy levels. And I think I saw like a couple uh, break the $1,000 mark on the resale market. The 823 is a very popular pen. And what was interesting about it, it was kind of a remake of a classic. I've wanted an 823 for quite some time, but I really didn't like the amber color or the dark smoky color. And I didn't want another clear demonstrator. I just have a gajillion of them. So I just kept holding off. And all of a sudden when this came up, you know, with the blue color and the kind of the, the interesting nib. Yeah, it just like hit a home run for me. And um, so I'm calling it the, the, the pen of the year this year is the remake of the A23, the Fujiyama Blue. And it just hits so many, so many points. It's a, it's a very good pen. It's a reliable pen. And they basically took a classic and kind of made it nicer, made it interesting. And um, I really hope that there will be more of these kinds of collaborations where they'll take classic pens that are rather boring as far as just the finish, but the pen itself is an excellent pen, and do something interesting like that. I'd, I'd really like to see more of that. And, and I really can't make a prediction because I don't know why like Pilot didn't make more, but I do know that there's definitely a market for it, how quickly the A23 did sell out. Okay, and then what I consider to be the world's greatest pen, the GOAT, is the Pilot Kakuno. It just hits so many things for me. It's um, inexpensive, you know, you can throw it around, it's pretty sturdy, it doesn't dry out, and the feed and the nib come completely out so you can experiment with inks and clean it out really easy. They came out with their family of Kakuno pens. So instead of just their normal smiley face, they had a mom, a dad, a son, and a daughter, all with different faces, and then they put it in the translucent body, which made the Kakuno really a much nicer looking pen. And I did a short on it, and I'll link it up here, but again, the greatest of all time pens just had kind of a mini facelift this year, and it was a fun one. Then there's a category of pens, which I call the I don't understand it category. I don't want one. Yeah. I have both. The first is Platinum's Shape of Heart. And it's basically their normal 3776 in a black body. And in the um, finial, there are some like little crystals and two of the gold hearts that are punched out of the nib when they make the heart shape breather hole in the nib. And I thought that was just kind of weird. And I it basically 
was for sale for several months before I even looked at it in a store. And I was looking around in Itoya, and it just occurred to me that it was such an odd pen. But a platinum fine nib, when you use a dark saturated ink, will write anywhere, just about on any kind of paper. It, sometimes when, um, I guess it's some of the broader nibs skip over smooth paper, that platinum F will write. And so it's kind of a no-nonsense mom pen. It's dark, but it still has like the little hearts in it. And it'll write anywhere when you need it to. And you know, when you uncap it, it's gonna write. So it's just like a useful weird pen and it kind of grew on me. And so, yeah, I have one and I love it. It's in, it's in my daily rotation now. I think that was probably the weirdest Platinum has gotten with their 3776. The other weird one was again Pilot. Pilot over there just like having some sort of convulsion or something, but it's the the Custom 74's 30th anniversary pen set. And it's basically a Custom 74 with a translucent cap. It looks black, but it's actually translucent. And um, three translucent barrels, like a, a brown and a blue and then kind of a turquoise. And I got it mainly because it's one of two pens that Pilot offers their, their reintroduced signature nib. And I, I really like the signature nib. It's a, it's, a, it's a much wider and it's probably a little bit too smooth for me. I may have to like rough it up a little bit. But it's the signature nib, so I, I wanted to get it for that. And also for the turquoise translucent body. But I just remember opening the box and just going, why do you, why is there three barrels? I mean, it's like, it's not like you're going to be changing hats or something. I, it was just so very odd. But then the, I tried it on on like, you know, different pen bodies. I thought, well, that looks kind of cool. And that looks kind of cool. And it just kind of grew on me. I was going to get the pen anyways because of the signature nib. But after a while, yeah, the only thing is you've got these two extra barrels just lying around. But in the end, I'm just really happy with the pen between the signature nib and the turquoise body. So as far as um, my predictions for next year, I think we're going to continue seeing uh, frosted, matte, and translucent bodies. These are kind of ways to have different finishes on a pen that's not just adding glitter to it. I'm not going to call the demise of glitter, but I think these other kinds of finishes might start crowding out a little bit of some of the really glittery pens. And my other prediction is about Pilot. I've got this, you know, Pilot's probably my favorite pen company. Even though I really enjoy a platinum nib, Pilot's probably my favorite. For a lack of a better word, their hiccups. They kind of sput out these weird things like their SE pen. I don't know why they called it an SE. It's kind of a silly name. But that's the first time it came out with kind of a swir swirly thing. And then it went on to the capless this past year. And then like their Itoshizuku mini bottle sets. It's the same Itoshizuku ink. They just kind of repackaged it in these sets. Which, again, I think they were trying to appeal to the Inkanuma ladies. But it's the same ink. And then, you know, like their custom 74 anniversary one. It was... Uh, a strange idea. So I think this coming year, Pilot's just gonna like burp up something weird. And I'm, I'm curious to see what it is. And according to Jacob from Fudafan, that Pilot's bottom line is the best of the three major Japanese uh, fountain pen companies. So they can really afford to go out there and try some weird stuff. So I'm actually looking, really looking forward to whatever weird thing Pilot wants to come up with this year. Now we come to ink. This is kind of how I feel about ink. This picture was taken by Luke Copping, a photographer that I follow on Instagram. His portraits are just brilliant. He really thinks outside of the box and I really enjoy his Instagram and I'll link that along with his website in the show notes. If I'm ever in the Buffalo area, I want him to take a picture of me like bathing in ink. Instead of telling you what I saw that happened in the ink market this year in Japan, I'm going to make a really bold prediction. And then using the things that I saw this year, I'm going to back up that prediction. I'm going to kind of like prove my case. And this prediction, some of you are really, really not going to like it. You, you can beat me up in the comments. Here in Japan about four years ago, um, a phenomenon called Inkanuma really became 
popular. It was about three or four years ago that I went to my first Ink Swamp show. And Inkanuma means ink swamp. It means you're kind of like drowning in a swamp of ink. And basically Inkanuma it, it is mostly young women that like to buy different kinds of ink and swatch it or write letters with it or whatever, but they almost always use a dip pen or, or in particular a glass pen. And so collecting different inks from different stores across of the nation and using beautiful glass pens is kind of the whole point of this hobby. Now, I know many of you know about Ink Numa, but a lot of people don't in the West. And I know a lot of you are going, well, a lot of people swatch ink and a lot of people like collecting ink, but I don't think you understand what a monster this is. A monster. I mean, it's, it's all about the ink. And I've been to ink shows, especially at the beginning when it was really difficult to get some certain inks, where people have like just about bowled me over to get to whatever bottle of ink they needed to get because it was a limited edition. And it, it, it's the ink itself is the important part. Every year, the pen group I'm in here in Japan, in Tokyo, we always say next year, Inkanuma is going to start to fade. It's going to settle down people are going to start getting over it and every year we're wrong. That's probably one thing we can be 100% sure is that we're wrong on our prediction of Inkanuma. So instead of fighting that, I'm going to go where it leads me. My prediction is this Inkanuma phenomenon and I'm going to call it ink play because that makes actually more sense for people in the West. Ink swamp doesn't quite mean anything to people but ink play, playing with ink. Ink heads do ink play. That's what I'm going to call it. This phenomenon of ink play is going to be bigger than fountain pens in the coming years. Fountain pen ink is going to become more important and more big than fountain pens themselves. Fountain pens will just be a way to express yourself in ink or a tool you would use for ink. But the primary thing that's going to appeal to people is fountain pen ink. But let me present my case. The first is Ted Onishi's guitar ink. A little over a year ago, I picked up my first bottle of guitar ink. It was at a Tokyo Hands, and there were only four colors available. And nobody had heard of it, and uh, the packaging is really interesting, but I didn't think the ink was really that special. And I researched the company and the closest I could figure out was like it had made markers of some sort of chemical company that made um, markers. But the two things that struck me was that they had really interesting packaging and they were quite inexpensive. So in this past year, they went from four colors of ink to 16 colors. And then they added another eight colors, which they call their standard inks. I'm not sure what standard color inks are, but they're in a much smaller bottle. And that, and each bottle is like $3. And that takes advantage of two things. One is that people want to try different inks. They don't want large bottles of ink anymore. They don't want to get, you know, the best price per milliliter anymore. They want to be able to not overall pay a lot of money. So they want smaller bottles of ink. So it's a smaller bottle, but then also each bottle is like $3. So they've hit two things that are going to be very popular, and I think are very popular. And then they put out this packet of ink testing felt tip pens. Now a lot of people know about Kakimori and a couple of the companies where you know you put the little felt thing inside the ink and it fills up and then you can pop it into like a plastic body and then it becomes like a felt tip pen and you're using your fountain pen inks. A lot of people, a lot of different companies are making that now, but this is three for like three dollars. Each of these plastic pens is like a dollar here in Japan. At a dollar a piece you can try a lot of different inks and if you never want to use a fountain pen you can very cheaply put together a felt tip pen with your favorite fountain pen ink. Guitar just hits so many things. They have a variety of colors, 16 normal colors and eight of their standard colors. They uh, made some of their inks incredibly cheap. They've made an incredibly inexpensive way to test these inks at a dollar a pop 
in something other than a fountain pen. And they have really interesting packaging. They came out with a pen themselves. They've just absolutely exploded this year in one year. I think this is a combination of really smart marketing on their part and also the explosion of interest in ink because they've brought the price down. And a lot of people can now start experimenting it without really having a big outlay of money. And the next is Ferris Wheel Press. I'm going to be completely blunt here. I, I love their ink. I, I think it's a great company. I love their stuff. But to be really blunt, their pens are just so-so. Their fountain pens, I, I had a brush pen of theirs. It's, it's the name of one of their fountain pens. And I, and I gave it away. It's a beautiful pen, but it was pretty middle of the road um, as far as fountain pens go. Though the, the marketing and the design of it is really pretty. And if you look at their their fountain pen bottles they're pretty not practical you've got the round one that rolls all over the place and their caps unless you really mess with the little plastic thing that goes on the top of their caps the little bolt looking cap they leak uh, there's some things that are just impractical about it but i love them <laughs> their marketing is awesome their their bottles are beautiful their colors are beautiful even their boxes are beautiful i mean each box tells a little bit different story in relation to the name of the ink. They have gorgeous design and I think their prices were probably a little high for maybe a novice user. But I think they started to recognize that and they made a smaller version of their large balloon bottle. Their balloon bottle was like 85 milliliters. They went down to the more, their little bit more flat bottle and that's 38 milliliters. And then they've got some smaller balloon bottles at 20 milliliters. So they've kind of, and they also have their like their little chargers where you can get three very, very small bottles of ink. So they've been price sensitive that way that you can get a little bit less ink and maybe pay a little bit le less price, but still get the beautiful packaging and design. So they've been sensitive to making their ink a little more available to a wider range of people. But again, they've kept a really high quality design and just beautiful packaging and as a result they just completely this past year stormed all over the Inconuma ladies here. I mean there isn't a woman that uses ink in Japan that doesn't know what Ferris wheel press is and that happened within about the last year and a half. You go into any major important stationery store in Tokyo and they just got boxes of uh, Ferris wheel press. Uh, Staya's um, stationery store. The um, Itoya has a huge amount. Just wherever you go, if there's an ink, if there's ink there, there's going to be some Ferris wheel press, and they're and they're almost always when they show up at any of the ink shows or stationery shows, it's just a huge crowd around their table. They're incredibly successful here in Japan, and we're talking about the land of stationery, the land of ink, the land of fountain pens. They're incredibly popular and within a year and a half they just took over. I think one of the reasons because it kind of embodies one of the things about ink play. It's the whole meditative having something beautiful in your life where you have to sit down, look at the beautiful box, use the beautiful bottle, use the beautiful color, use your beautiful glass pen or whatever. And it's kind of a time out where it's not, doesn't cost you calories. Um, it's quiet, it's reflective. It kind of embodies a lot of one of the reasons why I think Inconuma ladies like ink so much. And then next, there's just a sheer, sheer number of different properties of ink. Before you used to pretty much well be, is an ink a waterproof? Or is it not waterproof? Then it got into people started getting into shading. Is this ink a good shader? Then it got into maybe sheening. And that's kind of where it stopped for a long time. That it was, you know, waterproof, not waterproof, you know, dye or pigment. And did you have some sheening or shading? And now there's just huge amounts of different properties people are looking at. Along with those traditional properties, you also have chromo shading inks, you know, where they shade different colors. And then color changing inks, where as you write, the color changes, which is probably mostly because they're acidic based inks, like an iron gall or something. But then also inks that look different on different papers, which is not necessarily the property of the 
ink itself. It could just be the property of the paper. But having ink show up as different colors on different paper and people like experimenting with that and cataloging that. Of course, you have glitter inks with different kinds of glitter, gold glitter, silver glitter, rainbow glitter, additives that you can put add glitter into an ink. And you have ink made of natural materials. Tag has four different kinds, indigo, cedar, and I think one that's made out of caterpillar poop. I mean, they're all made of natural ingredients and they're very light, kind of um, soft pastel colored inks. Tone on Limbs has had just so many different kinds of ink. They've had ink with iron filings in it before. And this one called Deep Space. It looks like, you know, kind of a nice soft green, something you might want to just splash around on a piece of paper. But if you add water to it, um, a pink color comes out. This one here is Light Taupe's Petite Jardin. And this one is a mix of both the dye and pigment ink. It doesn't really there isn't so much pigment and it's not so big that it, it drifts to the bottom of the bottle. But when you write with it and later and water goes over it, uh, some of the most of the color will lift off, but you'll still have legible writing underneath. I'm not sure that's why she made it that way, but to get the particular color that she wanted, she used both a pigment and a dye. There's even ink from Fuga Pen Company that's made out of goji berries, and I um took a pen filled with that to our, my last pen meet, and it was just a huge hit. Everybody loved the color, the fact that it was made of goji berries. I mean, um, that's from Fuga Pens, and I'll be doing a video on them later. They make all kinds of stuff, but, um, you know, goji berry ink. Then there's the huge number of ink accoutrements. You, you've got glass pens and like ink puddles, and I kind of talk about that in my uh, Japanese glass pen video. That's the initial stuff. But it turns out that you can get beakers and then modified beakers with like little characters on them, like this sheep one here. Then to test out inks, you have Sailor's Hokoro. Pilot has, has one, and it, it just it turned out to be not very good, so I don't even talk about it. But Sailor has one called the Hokoro, and at first it was a lot like the pilot one. It was plastic and you know it didn't it you know it was it was portable and you could use it, it was inexpensive. But they ended up really improving it by adding the feed. And this feed is very easy to clean. You know, you can just dunk it in water a couple times and it cleans out, but yet it holds some ink in there. And so you can just use that to test out different inks, or even like many people do, just like write a letter or actually use it as a pen. And then Kaki Mori had their interesting nib here and that was quite popular. I mainly use it for swatching. And then Tag's dip pen, it's just like almost like a G nib. And this one here is frosted and they have like different kinds of wood you can use for it. But they also put a reservoir in the back of it so that you can hold ink. And this is in a country where, you know, Western calligraphy is not that popular. And then you have this chameleon called the Fonte. And Fonte first started out where you could just pick like the body and the cap color of a pen and it was a fountain pen. And they went, oh, well, you know, let's put a ballpoint pen and tip in there. And they went, oh, let's put a brush tip pen in there. And now you can buy a Fonte, both the cap and the body for less than $10. And then you add on either a fountain pen tip, a ballpoint tip or brush tip, or in this case, a glass pen tip. Japan's premier fountain pen magazine. This one is called Shimi no Bungubako. This is their latest edition. It's I think the first one for 2023. And it's based basically fountain pen, like great enjoyment. And it has all kinds of articles on the different kinds of ink, where you can get them, what their properties are and stuff. And they have a fold out of like all the different fountain pen, all the different fountain pen ink companies and where their colors fall in line in the different color areas. So it's on the back also. And it's just like, you know, Mont Blanc, Roaring Klingner, Diamine, Linen Toolbar, all the KWZ, Robert Oster. It's got all the different inks and you can kind of catalog what the different companies have. So maybe about three or four years ago was when the first time I saw an ink edition of this pen. And when it came out, we were all excited. Wow, Shimino Bungabako came out with an ink edition of their magazine. And like I like I bought two copies of it. One that you know I could keep at home and one that I carried the inserts around with me. I'm not sure why I did that, but it was just exciting that the Fountain Pen magazine put so much emphasis on ink. And now it's like 
they put out a special ink edition maybe once or twice a year. They cover glass pens and stuff. It's now a regular part of their magazine and it's like kind of old hat. So ink has now made the arc where it's just a normal part of like all the fancy pens that are normally posted in this magazine. What makes ink play the great equalizer is you don't have to have good handwriting. You don't have to know how to do calligraphy. You don't have to be an artist. And you can definitely be all three of those and really enjoy the ink, but you don't have to be those. You can just dip the ink like many people do here in Japan. It's just dip whatever color ink you want, write a letter to someone and in the middle of it, you can just change ink to another color or on a different page or a different paragraph. Or you can talk about the qualities of the ink as you write your letter to your friend. You don't have to have any special abilities to be able to use the ink and play with it. You can splash it or you can make a normal like ink catalog page with different kinds of instruments using the ink. Or you can use it to kind of like dress up your journaling, make it fun. So ink play is only going to get bigger in 2023. I think we're going to see, continue to see many different kinds of inks, maybe new companies putting out inks, uh, people expanding, companies expanding their ink line. So I think ink play is just going to get bigger and I think it's going to maybe be more entrenched, become more entrenched in the Western world. Probably not to the extent it is here in Japan, but I think more and more people especially if the price is, comes down, there's smaller bottles of ink, a less initial money outlay to play around with ink. I think it's just going to involve more and more people that are going to understand maybe that's just something fun to do. And, and it may not be like a major hobby for some people, maybe just something they enjoy doing every once in a while. So I think ink play is going to eclipse fountain pens. And I really don't mind. It just means I can connect with more people and amongst our different hobbies. But I still love fountain pens. And so for my giveaway, it's going to be Mato Zen's special edition Lemon Lamy Safari. Mato Zen, for some reason, I don't really know the history of it, but they they do a lot of lemon themed things. Lemon themed, I've got some lemon themed stickers and stationery. They regularly do like lemon themed fountain pens for their twice a year special shows. But this one I saw at their show this past fall, and it was just so cute, but I don't really use a Lamy Safari. And I decided I wanted to get it and save it for the end of year giveaway. It comes in this really cool lemon-like box, and it comes in a yellow pouch, and then it's kind of an interesting looking green color, along with these little lemons on the clip. And as usual, just head on over to my Instagram, follow me, and then drop a comment anywhere underneath the picture of this lemon Safari pen. And I'll just do a, a random comment uh, picker and before my next uh, long form video and I'll announce the, the winner of my next video. So Happy New Year. I hope you guys have a, a wonderful and prosperous 2023 and I'll be going to several pen shows in the United States this year. I'm, I'm planning on it. So hopefully I'll be able to run into some of you there at the pen show and please don't hesitate to come up and say hi.